Hi, my friend. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. We are uh, here again. Uh, I just uh, come back uh, uh, recently from my trip. As uh, we mentioned last time in my last video, I told you that uh, <clears throat> I was uh, going to travel to Central Asia and uh, I've been to Kazakhstan and I've been to Uzbekistan. I spent <clears throat> almost 20 days there, uh, traveling around and basically go to see uh, the countries and uh, try to understand uh, what is uh, the what they are doing now about the the project the new Silk Road. And I, I I was tra I travel a lot and uh, I can say that is a little bit tough because uh, this period is extremely hot, is a uh, very dry, very dry, and um, I can say the distance. Uh, uh, between the cities uh, are uh, extremely, uh, extremely large. And, uh, you know, imagine that uh, Kazakhstan, uh, I can say that is uh, as a, a surface uh, mostly equivalent to Western Europe. And uh, Uzbekistan, that looks like uh, small countries in, the, in, the, in the Central Asia. If you go and check uh, the <clears throat> square kilometers, you see that it is uh, one and a half time uh, more than that of Italy. So uh, we are talking about a very huge uh, area where the, with uh, uh, not uh, much uh, population. We are talking about uh, Kazakhstan, less than 20 million, and uh, Uzbekistan, uh, close to 30 million people with a huge distance, okay, and also with uh, 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 structures of uh, road, of uh, train, that are uh, growing now, but not yet completed. But, uh, this one I will talk more in the, my next uh, videos, okay? because, uh, you know, um, I have, a, <clears throat> I have, a, uh, my idea was uh, to introduce, um, you know, uh, this project uh, of the new uh, Silk Road, but uh, when I've uh, been there and I have seen uh, and I've visited many, many cities, uh, I realized that uh, also for me it's much uh, more important to have uh, a clear understanding first uh, of uh, uh, the function of the old Silk Road and the why now basically uh, China wanted to duplicate this uh, uh, model uh, after you know many centuries and uh, which are uh, which are the reason why so to understand the reason why definitely we have to go back uh, and see uh, what was the old Silk Road so this time uh, I will try to spend uh, uh, I mean to be quite short uh, and to, to give you a, a simple, I can say, presentation about uh, some slide I took it, some slide I, I, I take from uh, from internet. So some is my picture, some other material that you can easily find. And, uh, you know, one aspect uh, also of this video that uh, I will try is an experiment. Okay, let's put it this way, it's an experiment. I will try to make this video a little bit more interactive also with some uh, some slides, some uh, some um, some a bit of a presentation about uh, the geography of the place. Okay, uh, to start with, I want to be to be <clears throat> go, I want to go directly to the point. Let's put it in this way that uh, you know during uh, my trip and also reading some books and talking with the people. Uh, three concepts uh, I wanted to highlight uh, from the beginning. First of all, uh, the Silk Road was not a road, 
but there was a network which evolved during the centuries. So, uh, also from the materials that I will go to, to show you now, you will see that uh, has been a, a, a great uh, inter a great interconnections of a road uh, going, uh, uh, let's say, on north part of the territories, what is now Russia, and then some others going in the central part of, uh, a of Asia, like uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan now, uh, Iran, and so on. Some other are uh, maritime route, some other going uh, south uh, uh, to India, for example. So it's a, it's a network, okay? It's a network of road and uh, maritime uh, trade. This is the point. Um, another point that when we talk about uh, the same point, when we talk about the network, uh, I would like to stress one concept that the network does not imply that we just move goods, but it implies also that we move ideas, concept. We move a person, we move a people that are uh, professional, that they move from a country to another one because they want to, to, to bring their skill or they are requested to bring their, their uh, skill to other places. So, is really a concept of network. Uh, another point that I would like to, to express, uh, just a three points, don't be afraid, it's not <laughs> just three. The second one is the safety. Because imagine, okay, you, we are merchant and we want to carry our goods from one place to another one by far. We are talking about a thousand of kilometers. Okay, so peer-to-peer, -peer, more than 10,000 kilometers. Okay. So uh, we carry with us our goods, valuable goods, can be silk, can be paper, can be gold, can be silver, can be fabrics. Okay, so in any case, are valuable. So uh, imagine that uh, in uh, this situation, the safety of the trading is a must. So why the Silk Road uh, worked pretty well for almost, uh, let's say, a little bit less than 2,000 years? Works uh, because uh, it, they rely on the local government that they control that area. They respect the merchant, the rules. We can say the law. Okay, but of course, uh, it's not only uh, they rely on uh, this uh, local government. Okay, but also they uh, try to uh, work together and uh, to travel together. So, uh, just to, I want to be very, very clear and very operative. At that time, they move basically on uh, camels they carry the they, they also uh, the people some people that are walking just about you know normally the speed was the the, the, the speed of the camel and uh, the normal uh, traveling day that time was uh, 25 kilometer per day okay so you have to imagine that uh, through all uh, this uh, route uh, not one, but network, they built a structure of uh, uh, markets, accommodation, we can call now hotels, but accommodations for merchants and animals that are keep separate. Okay? Now the things that sometimes we, we mix it up, we think that caravan serraglio is one place with animal and, and goods and the merchant is not true. It's completely separate. Um, so they uh, travel in uh, caravans, okay, because of the safety. They can make the time 25 kilometers per day, okay. And uh, now we introduce uh, the other point, the third point. Uh, so from uh, the, the data we collect uh, and uh, we read also on the books, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, the uh, principal function of the Silk Road uh, has never been a peer-to-peer -peer system 
for um, trading. But it was a system of uh, trading activities based uh, mostly on uh, regional trade activities. What does it mean? It means that uh, if we consider Rome in the west and Beijing in the east, uh, the majority of the trading is not uh, Rome to Beijing, but it was uh, the, uh, uh, the regional trade between uh, each uh, region, because otherwise uh, the, the, the trip uh, will be uh, too long, it uh, too many years. And also we understand why Central Asia become uh, so important, because uh, the goods, uh, they went, uh, be, I mean, they, they go, they, they were arranged to go from uh, west and east to Central Asia, to place where there was a market, where demand uh, and, uh, and uh, the offer, they, um, they match together, okay? So there are really a uh, physical market uh, where the people, they station there, not that they travel, but they bring the things, uh, they live there, and, uh, you know, they trade, and, and they exchange, and so on. Also, we have physical evidence of these kind of things. This is very, very important because also to understand what uh, uh, the China government intended to do now with uh, this investment in infrastructural that is uh, doing uh, in a uh, major city in Central Asia. So, um, once uh, we said this one, I really wanted to introduce uh, just a few slides, just, just to have an idea about uh, about uh, uh, you know the the old Silk Road and uh, where it's been and also uh, when I was there you know I asked myself some questions some others the 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 other people with me they ask so I try to put uh, together something. You know. The point is this one: um, some people they uh, when they, they talk about the old Silk Road they start uh, saying about. Uh, uh, the importance uh, of uh, Alexander the Great uh, and uh, the, um, Alexander the Great uh, in the in the formation of the of the Silk Road. Let's let's uh, be clear one thing. So now I prepare just a few slides. Alexander the Great start his invasion in uh, 334 BC. He invaded the Persian Empire, and uh, you can uh, see quite well from this map that I search for you <laughs> um, where he arrived. Okay, basically, uh, he arrived, uh, he conquered uh, Egypt, uh, and then uh, all the uh, all the the, the place uh, what is now uh, Turkey, and then uh, the Syria. And he entered in Iran and uh, all uh, the countries uh, uh, that are uh, Central Asia uh, up to, uh, say, uh, India and, and uh, Pakistan. Um, he stopped there for, uh, I think, this, uh, uh, this map uh, is playing uh, a little bit more, better than, one, than uh, the words why he stopped there. Stop there for two reasons, let's say, several reasons. But one, because uh, he was tired, okay, and uh, especially his uh, soldiers were tired. Then, uh, because uh, he encountered some natural obstacles. Natural obstacles, uh, what are? Are basically the great mountain, the plateau of the Tibet. They uh, also have uh, uh, some battles in the south with uh, the, the, the Indians. And uh, they have, uh, they use, at uh, uh, the time they already use uh, elephant. It was not used to this kind of battle, but managed to, in any case, uh, to, to win, but not to, to completely defeat them. But especially we have to watch uh, the geography because the geography explains uh, a lot about uh, a lot about uh, the uh, the silk the old silk road why he didn't go up to the north uh, and he didn't go 
in the direction of uh, Turco-Mongolian tribes. He then go there, actually the, there is very flat the land, very flat. So flat uh, that uh, the Tsar was able to, uh, to run a train. No, there is a train that is going across in the, the Transiberian, Transiberiana. Okay. Why Alexander didn't go there? Because he is very inhospitable lands. So doesn't grow anything. It's pretty cold, very flat. Nothing grows there. I mean, is is like a bit uh, a, a desert. Okay. So he preferred to uh, to go in the, the middle part, and then when he reached some uh, natural obstacle, and especially. Uh, the India and uh, he has to uh, as to decide to go back. Um, in this other slide, basically you see an important uh, mosaic. Uh, basically, the when uh, Alexander defeated uh, Dario uh, in uh, or Persia, okay, and the year you will see another one. That is uh, uh, just uh, to remind you that uh, Alexander the Great uh, decide to stop in Samarkand, that it, be, it will become later one of the capital, the main city of the Silk Road. Now we are not talking yet the Silk Road attention, we are talking about the pre Silk Road. Uh, decide to what where is uh, written here, Bactria and uh, so on, basically in that area, for, uh, for three years. Uh, why? Because uh, he understood that is uh, uh, very important uh, strategically. He understood uh, he liked the, um, the area where the, um, the weather was, uh, temp was uh, more acceptable, where he can fight food for his soldiers. And also, he tried to create. Uh, uh, he tried to 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 create uh, a kind of uh, uh, colony of uh, of the Greece, of the Macedonian, and uh, a push uh, is a uh, soldier and uh, officers to marry with uh, uh, local 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 uh, local uh, girls, and uh, they stayed there for three years, and uh, they left uh, in that area that uh, is called Bactria. They left uh, quite tangible, a lot of signs, okay, a lot of signs of their culture, costume, language, uh, uh, coins, uh, a lot of things, a lot of things that are still now uh, going around. Uh, you know, you can see, and you can see in the museum, but also you can see from the, the name of the place. So it left a very important, uh, very important uh, um, heritage. But an important point. Uh, Alexander the Great uh, did not open the Silk Road. He was just uh, he was just uh, able to um, uh, to see one part. Maybe we can we can say that uh, he reached uh, fifty percent. Uh, let's put it this way: he reached fifty percent of the Silk Road. Okay, but has to go back, especially because, uh, as we said, uh, his soldiers. Uh, uh, the campaign was too long, and uh, also some uh, sequence they have, and so on. Um, now we jump uh, over a few centuries because uh, I don't want to uh, bother you with uh, heavy, heavy stuff, uh, but just to want to some glimpse about uh, you know some uh, major events uh, that happen on the Silk Road. Uh, uh, before his uh, collapse and why the Silk Road collapsed. And uh, with the collapse of the Silk Road, also uh, the China uh, Empire uh, started to uh, crumble, started to lose power. Okay, so uh, let's go to the, this. Uh, this one is uh, a map, uh, a map uh, of uh, Eurasia, they call it Eurasia the time of uh, the Roman Empire. The, in China, we have the Han Empire. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, we have the Roman Empire, that in the 100, basically, 
it was uh, quite large and occupy you see Turkey and uh, all Egypt uh, and all the coast uh, what is now uh, Syria you can read uh, Palmyra some <laughs> some uh, some name so uh, from this slide you understand clearly one thing so that uh, the Han Empire occupy a very important strategic role of this Silk Road. Basically, they, um, they uh, control up to what we saw here, the, um, the um, uh, Takalamakan uh, Taklamakan Desert. Okay? Um, Taklamakan Desert is the, how can I say, is the barrier. Okay, is the physical barrier between China and the other part of Asia, not yet Europe, but the other part of Asia. It's a physical barrier. I've been there and uh, I will explain you why. It was difficult uh, 2000 years ago, as is difficult now. It's difficult for two reasons, because uh, if you come from China, you have uh, to cross uh, two deserts, basically. One is the Gobi, that is where the Mongol, basically north of Virginia, and the other one is the Taklamakan Desert. Especially this second one is extremely dry and is surrounded by high mountains. So is uh, um, it's quite, uh, it reach a very high temperature uh, during the year, uh, especially in uh, spring and summer. And uh, the, the little water they have uh, evaporate uh, easily. Uh, so it cannot be crossed uh, directly, but you know, has to be going around or south, north. But then the point that when you arrive to the last city that now is Kashka, Okay, finally, you cross all the desert. You go from Urumqi, you go to Kashgar, and now, now you have the Pamir in front of you. So, uh, this is a huge obstacle, even now. Uh, do not imagine that uh, the, from Kashgar, um, basically, you can enter in uh, Central Asia easy. Not at all. Okay, later I will show you some pictures and some, uh, um, you know, some, you know, some, some more detail in the second part of the presentation. But basically, you have uh, to cross the mountain, okay, and uh, the pass, the, the the road to cross the mountain, are uh, quite high. So, if you go north, that is more uh, is cooler you have a 3,000 meter pass, but you know, it's quite complicated actually, it's up and down and it's quite long. Then you have a 3,005 in, in the south, then you have a straight road, extremely south, then I will give you the name, but it goes more than 4,000 meters, 4,500, okay? So, if you want to have a straight road, you have to go up. If you want to have a, a road, uh, you know, lower, you have to go Far, you know, much more north, and then and then turn again, and then going down south. So, it is a is a geographical obstacle that uh, to even today we are in the 21st century have difficulties to cross, and uh, is where the Chinese are investing deeply. Okay, I saw some uh, some um, some some work, and I understood the difficulties. So I can say that basically there are um, a few kind of difficulties. Basically, you have uh, to build a uh, uh, road. You have to build uh, uh, tunnels, and you have to build a bridge. Okay, uh, because of the composition of terrain that is extremely, sometimes is uh, friable, uh, and sometimes is very hard. Uh, uh, the technique uh, are sophisticated and uh, normally uh, the Chinese uh, take care about bridge and take care about tunnels. When we talk about road, uh, are the local governments they do it. But I want to stress one point, that to open a road there, it means uh, not to go there and, uh, you know, just uh, put some uh, 
uh, some uh, beton or to do a pavimentation and do a road. You have to open the road through the explosion of dynamite. So a uh, really uh, road built, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting part of the mountains and these mountains are very rocky and very hard. So let's go back to our uh, to the Roman Empire. So you see that uh, so the Chinese they control uh, all the strategic point. And then you have the Bactria that I re remember from the slide before was the area where Alexander the Great uh, stationed uh, quite long and the left uh, left uh, really is soldiers and uh, uh, a form of government. Then we have the Persian and the Armenia and so on. Okay. So that this is the, the, the Roman the, the Roman period, how it looks like the, <coughs> the Silk Road. Then uh, uh, here we are in the 13th century. 13th century we have uh, the Mongol Empire Silk Road. Mongol Empire Silk Road, uh, this map uh, is uh, um, dated, uh, I believe, uh, uh, yes, 13th century, so it's uh, uh, 1260, I believe. So you can see that uh, the Mongol Empire uh, basically control uh, uh, quite deeply the old, the old, the traffic, okay, uh, from the uh, from China, from Korea, from uh, you can see south of China, uh, through Persia, good in Baghdad, and then going uh, around uh, what is now the Black Sea, what is now uh, Ukraine, okay, and. Uh, uh, it was the, the major expansion of the, the Mongol empires. But you know, this is show that uh, at least uh, until uh, the 13th century, uh, the East uh, controlled uh, the Silk Road uh, much more than was controlled by the West, okay? Um, so um, this is quite important because uh, uh, China, in, his, in some way, always consider the Silk Road uh, like uh, something that uh, belongs to their uh, tradition, okay? Uh, also because uh, this uh, army over Genghis Khan, together with the Turks, uh, and if you want to, we'll open a, a small uh, parenthesis about uh, Turks, uh, because Turks are not the inhabitant of uh, Turkey, okay? I will explain later. Um, so they control the traffic, they control uh, um, uh, or they may, the major the important uh, areas and, uh, and, the, and the, the road and the, the trading. So what's happened? Happened that uh, um, the Mongols, of course, uh, they do have uh, after Genghis Khan, uh, there was a different Khan uh, and uh, uh, was not uh, then started to fight with the local population. Okay, this one, this slide is 1250 until the 15th century, basically, in a way or in the other, they hold the power in this part of the world. And then we arrive to the top, to the top of the expansion of the east, okay? So here we have, uh, this is a, is a picture that uh, I did, okay? Uh, Amir Timur, I mean, uh, nobody knows because uh, in, uh, in, um, in our school, they teach, all, they teach us uh, in Italian, the Tamerlano, in English, uh, Tamerlane. Where come from Tamerlane? Tamerlane, he comes from uh, Timur the Lame, cioè Timur lo Zoppo, okay? So in our books, uh, he, he arrived at Tamerlane or Tamerlano, okay? He, actually, I like to call with his name as Amir Timur, okay? Amir Timur was a warrior, was a warrior, he was a Turk, 
origin and uh, I believe that was uh, married with uh, uh, with um, uh, Mongols uh, coming from direct uh, descendant of uh, Genghis Khan. So he was uh, the, um, the ruler of the area, now is Uzbekistan, and he represents the maximum expansion of uh, um, uh, the conquest of a single man in his reign. Okay. So even the Roman Empire was not so fast in acquiring land uh, through a single emperor as uh, Tamerlane did. Tamerlane, basically, I'll show you here, uh, died in uh, 1405, and uh, all the green part that you see it was uh, under his uh, under his uh, uh, control, but you see there that there is, uh, I mean, it seems uh, I mean, there is uh, Samarkand, Erat, there is uh, Baghdad, there is uh, basically all the countries uh, around the Caspian, uh, around the Caspian Sea, and uh, he exercised also quite uh, stronger pressure on the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this um, slide is important for one point because uh, because um, this one it, it can be the turning point of the Silk Road. Um, Timur was uh, a fighter. He fought for 35 years to conquest uh, and control all this area. During uh, uh, this year, the Central Asia. Uh, was uh, uh, one of the best places because uh, he spent a fortune in uh, making the Silk Road uh, safety, in building uh, uh, building uh, uh, space for the merchant, in create a market, in create a mosque, in create a madras that are the, the school, no? where the, the people. The, they learn the religion, the study. And also, uh, it was uh, very, very important because uh, he, um, he has uh, um, connections with uh, uh, Spain and uh, he has, uh, uh, in Samarkand, he, keep, uh, he has uh, ambassadors, for, for example, ambassador for Spain. And uh, through this uh, knowledge that um, he has, through these uh, contacts, Basically, he was able to recruit important architects, important people, uh, physicians, um, people that study mathematician, uh, architect, and so on. So we understand if we go there why that uh, part of the world was so rich in terms of culture, in terms of building, in terms of engineering, and I must say that. Uh, what uh, China learned, uh, many of the things from the West, uh, due to this period, and the things that uh, physically he, he, he do it. Uh, for example, for example, I'll show you the uh, slide. Okay, in uh, uh, look back that there was a um, relative of uh, Timur, uh, he was an astronomer and uh, he was also a mathematician and um, besides to be a ruler of uh, one of the city, uh, he understood the importance of science. We are talking about uh, uh, 1394, okay, uh, we're talking about 15th century, beginning of the 15th century. He understand the power of technology, the power of uh, uh, the power of uh, the, the physics, okay, the astronomy, and uh, he built uh, a sextant observatory that was completed in 1429, that was uh, uh, much before that one that we can observe now in Beijing, if uh, anybody is going there and see this, uh, this instrument. This is not an uh, opti uh, optical instrument, it's not a telescope, uh, it's a sextant, it's uh, a system to measure precisely 
uh, the angles of uh, uh, the stars and uh, the sun or the moon and is the, the movement the stars during the year and he catalogs something roughly uh, there is a book uh, um, roughly 1200 stars you know, perfectly perfectly okay we are talking about uh, uh, 1429 1430 okay he classified uh, why it was important that time uh, this kind of knowledge it was important because uh, because uh, um, they are uh, it was important to establish uh, uh, to calculate the distance uh, to to try to to build a map basically and uh, you can see that uh, from this picture uh, that is uh, quite a large instrument okay i've been there and uh, i think is uh, roughly as a diameter of 40 50 meters so what does it mean it means that they can determine precisely the position of the any object on the earth based on the on the star doesn't matter which uh, the, the measure is taken in April or in uh, or in, or in January because they have a map the sky they map the, they have the map with the sky and they, they know exactly they can build uh, um, they, can, they can build map okay they can build uh... this one was very important uh, for traveling the time uh, to build the city to build uh, uh, any also for military use. Uh, but it was try to understand that it was very very important for another things for the navigation why because is it true here yeah, i want to explain a small a small thing is it true that uh, the chinese uh, basically uh, with an invention of the compass give to the navigation an important uh, help because uh, Finally, we have an instrument, the compass, that allowed to understand uh, where is uh, the north, where is the south. Okay, but uh, until that time, uh, was not easy for them to understand the latitude. Okay, so they can go uh, south and north, but they cannot uh, understand uh, how much uh, north uh, they have to go and where they are. Okay, and uh, they can do through uh, the study of the stars. Okay, so the trigonometry to the mathematics. But uh, as you can understand from this instrument, this instrument you cannot bring on the on the navy. Okay, so here is when uh, with the with the with the fall with the death of uh, Timur, that was my opinion was the last great. Uh, Mongol descendant was the last great fighter. With the, the death of this uh, man, start the decline of uh, the East, because uh, after him, uh, the Silk Road start to become uh, less safe. Okay, because. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, city state uh, and uh, each uh, each uh, head uh, each um, king or, of a city state uh, has a different rules a different laws uh, they uh, charge the merchant uh, the ch merchant are upset they don't want to to uh, to, to tax uh, to pay to too much tax uh, and so on so start uh, a, and it was also not so safe as before uh, start uh, a kind of decline but but what Timur understood that uh, he has to bring uh, uh, technology uh, in order to um, in order to uh, to grow in terms of uh, knowledge in different fields like uh, like uh, we said uh, astronomy and uh, and and the the tools for uh, navigation basically uh, we can say that uh, this one was uh, battle that was uh, won by the western uh, countries and uh, in particular we have to remind uh, that in, in that period by the end of the 16th century uh, we just a reminder to great uh, to great um, um, uh, 
people that uh, they change uh, the history. There was a Cristoforo Colombo in the in the 1492 that was uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean and uh, reach uh, the um, America. But uh, another one that uh, sometimes we try to forget uh, and we forget uh, is Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama that in uh, so Colombo is 1492, Vasco da Gama in the 1497 make uh, the first real voyage to India. Okay, if uh, Colombo in some way uh, you want to go to India around uh, the world, but uh, he found uh, in the middle the United States, uh, Vasco da Gama succeed uh, because in 1997 uh, was the first, uh, see, he, he, he left uh, uh, Portugal, he went down uh, to the Canary Islands, then he went back, uh, and then he then decided to, to go extremely south, uh, around uh, uh, South Africa, Cape, uh, Cape of uh, Good Hope, so Madagascar, so he arrived basically in Calcutta, and uh, uh, go and, uh, in the Arabian Sea. And this one was a trip of, uh, of uh, two years, it was also an exploration trip, and uh, but this trip, uh, is the, the last slide that I have put because this one it represent what it represent in some way the um, I can say the the start of the, the declining uh, of the um, the silk uh, the old silk road uh, by uh, by Central Asia and the newborn activities of uh, uh, merchants uh, on the sea merchant on the sea that are uh, basically uh, which country here uh, we said uh, Spain okay that goes directly most uh, to South America was Portugal that was very active in Asia actually Vasco da Gama is Portuguese is open uh, is the first that opened the, the road to, to, to Asia and later we have the the England and the English Empire okay very and then uh, we understand uh, that uh, uh, China at this point was uh, isolated. So this is a very important point to understand also what uh, they are doing now with the new uh, Silk Road. China found herself in the uh, 16th century isolated because uh, by land we saw that the uh, Silk Road was still uh, in use but uh, not safe anymore okay uh, especially in the central part and uh, on the other things uh, we see a clear uh, a clear evidence that the merchants uh, they prefer their trip uh, uh, by sea uh, rather than uh, uh, by road because it was uh, faster in some way uh, after the, 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 the I mean, built of a new, new, new kind of vessel, in some way it was uh, safer. And uh, China was not able to compete uh, against uh, this, uh, uh, basically, this uh, European uh, nation, where we have to add also the Dutch, that uh, they occupy. Uh, the uh, southeast, let's put, uh, for instance, uh, Indonesia. Okay. So, um, isolation of China, so the failure of the uh, old Silk Road uh, start in the, in the 16th uh, century. And from that time, uh, uh, China was isolated uh, by, by the road. Uh, and it was isolated in some way also by the sea because all the, the route, all the vessel belongs to not not to, to not to China. I say this one uh, because uh, we wanted to introduce uh, you know uh, the new part of the Silk Road. So what they are doing now, I will do in the next uh, chapter chapter. But definitely the logic behind the first one you will see also in the new Silk Road. So I repeat a little bit, is uh, this a geographical obstacle in the central part of Asia that has to be solved. And then uh, it's very, very important, and here, here I stop it, to have the possibility to have control on the route, on the land, 
and to have control also on the route on the sea, because China was not able in the 16th century to uh, control and to have any um, possibility to control the maritime uh, route. So with this one, I say goodbye to the next uh, episode. I will try to make the next a little bit more uh, funny, and I hope this uh, interactive uh, interactive system this time uh, you, you like. Any comment, uh, please uh, just uh, write, uh, let me know. Thank you. Bye-bye.